OK, I think we'll get started. Hi, most, pretty much most people in the room have attended previous sessions, so I won't spend too much time on myself. I'm, I'm an independent consultant. I tend to do a lot of work around bridging between business and technology, so I'm trying to help tease out some of the challenges in those gaps that can arise between what the technology can do, but actually how do we get to use it and get, get what we want out of the technology. As part of this business track now, we're starting to look into some of the solutions. So we've had the search one yesterday. We've got some various ones today. And one of these, the, where the business comes to the, we need a portal. And well, what does that mean? And that's very much going to be the theme for the next hour. Um, first thing I would say back is, well, why? Why do you need a portal? It's a good starting point to think, why, why are we putting this in place? And... The answer I would always give here is it's really important is that a portal should be about improving decisions and actions. There should be an outcome. We're hoping to make a better, more informed decision, but that decision ultimately should lead to an action. Otherwise, we're just you know, looking at stuff, patting ourselves on the back for performance, but not changing anything. So a portal should be all about assisting decisions and actions. And I partly made this comment yesterday too, unless we manage to completely replace ourselves with robots, that's the human part of the equation. It's the person that will make the decision. It's the person, typically, that will then act as a result on that decision. Um, I'm going to repeat this slide at the end, so if you don't get it the first time, it'll be back up on screen. But if you're interested in this space, this is a book I read over 10 years ago. Now, it was partly what let this, plus one other book, led to me uh, setting up the consultancy called Sources of Power. It's by Gary Klein. If you've not heard of this book and you're interested in the challenges of getting technology working successfully in an organisation or where projects can fail, read this book. It's the best because it's all around how people make decisions and how we make abysmally bad decisions despite having all the information presented in front of us. It's got quite a lot of military emphasis in some of the decision making. Uh, there was one which caused a pretty significant error in the Gulf. And even though all the facts were there, it just didn't make any difference because somebody was expecting a certain outcome and the data was ultimately going to reinforce that expectation no matter what it said. So, very good book. Who here is familiar with, has heard of Malcolm Gladwell? He's written, a, yeah, he's quite a popular author. He's done Blink and The Tipping Point. Blink actually uses a lot of this as part of Blink. Um, I wouldn't want to dis dismiss Malcolm Gladwell. They're very good, very readable and enjoyable books, but they're almost the popcorn version. That said, very, very powerful too. One of his examples to demonstrate at a lighter level decisions um, is having a, in a university, they had a group of uh, undergraduates, <coughs> split them into two, and their whole, all of them understood they were going to be going and having a meeting with their tutor to review their performance. And actually, they were all going to get exactly the same review. But they were split into half, and one group were given a paragraph to read that contained lots and lots of negative words and ageing words and slowing down words and creating a mindset of, hmm... The others, very, very breezy, very awake, very positive. They went off and all had the same review, but when interviewed afterwards, how did the review go? Those who'd read the negative words beforehand were overwhelmingly more negative about their review than those who'd read the positives. And you'll find lots and lots of examples. It's very, very similar on the internet. It's frightening, quite honestly, how easily we are influenced by our environment. I'm having a great day. My attitude and interpretation of the data is going to be different than if I'm having an exceptionally bad day. If I've got all the time in the world to make a decision, the decision I make is likely to be different than if somebody's pressuring me with time. Now, 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 you've got to do something. It's really important because you can put all the features you want into tools like SharePoint. That won't change the human nature element, and it's the big, big part of any portal project. So, might as well cover Portal 101. What is a portal? We're not going to spend a whole hour on this, even though you could spend probably three years debating it, but good old Wikipedia. It's got as good a definition as any. A uh, web portal is a website that brings together information from diverse sources in a unified way, so there's a purpose. It's quite a nice, tight definition of what a portal should be achieving. You get information from multiple different sources, you're going to hopefully make a decision. The decision is around a purpose, that's the unified way. So, it's a good definition. Portals in 2001, we've been talking about portals in their various guises for a oh, good 10 years. I think I first started talking about them in 
1999-2000, back history of SharePoint, when it was in its Tahoe iteration, which myself and Paul were both involved in back in 1999, it was a document management add-on to Exchange. That was where it was being developed. It was going to be a collaborative tool with version control, classification, it was all around documents. Then portal concept exploded onto the market. Um, those of you on the technical side would show you, if you remember companies like Plum Tree and top tier, there was various early portal vendors. And so SharePoint's name was SharePoint Portal Server and it actually had a pretty rapid change into the world of portal. But I would go to numerous clients, and I'm sure Paul can contribute here too, they would draw this for me on the whiteboard. This would be the portal that they wanted, the four squares. And up in our top left, the corporate messages. Everybody in the company will see what's in this square. It will be standard to every single user. Division news, well, it's the division you work in. So we let the division heads control this space. You'll see a tailored message, but the whole division will see the message. Then we start to get into the personalization. This will now be about your team and your team's activities. And ideally, you'll get a personalized view of this, the, the activities you need to complete. And then finally, this bottom quadrant here, that's the personal stuff. We'll let the individual customize that themselves. I would sit through meeting after meeting and Paul. This is unique to us, this is all the stuff we want to do. The next bank meeting, another bank that Sharon and I went to, they came up with exactly the same thing. I swore everyone agreed it on the golf course or somewhere. It was quite amusing because I, I, it literally was drawn every time. And that was what put, it was all about widgets and we'd be able to move around some of them and lock other ones and that's Portal. We've moved on from there and Portal's evolved, if anything, into quite a broad phrase. When I work with clients and they're talking around a portal concept, I try to tease out early on, are they really talking portal? Are they really talking about decisions and actions? Or are they talking more about a platform change? Uh, it's, just, it's no big deal, but it helps you understand what type of problem you're looking to solve. The portal has this unified purpose. The platform has a framework that you don't necessarily know all the different purposes, but you're hoping to provide a feature set that will help satisfy a number of different ones. And I say it's no big deal which you're doing, but if people start with portal and you quickly realise they're talking about platform, that can be a much, much bigger project. So today, we typically see probably four broad different types of portal, each with its slightly different remit. If we start with the information portal, I was going to try and do sketches for this. Thank God I didn't, because I'd have been humiliated, so good old PowerPoint animation helped. Um, classic intranet, news-driven, often owned by marketing, owned by communications, often controlled messages. User interaction here, not overly required. Read the standard message. This is the official position of the company. Um, I cheekily put this box here, the you know, leading story with the next two, usually scrolling down on some kind of flash animation, very popular on websites as well at the moment. Uh, but the value from a decision and action point, yeah, this is probably the weakest portal scenario, but it will often fall in the same umbrella. This is your more classic intranet. To driven. And Sorry. That generally, can you go back to the slide? Yeah, of course. Oh, yes. And that oh generally God. is you've got the choice of two types of portals when people sign on to the, the, the website. One is the mind bending, mind information. This is the company view of the world. So some people, some companies will always have this as their information message to every single employee. Other people want it a different way around, and Sharon's going to come on to this, that it's a personalised one and you'll get your view as you go through. Absolutely. Uh, the content is quite similar. We're talking typically unstructured content, whether it's pages, whether it's documents, it's organising that sort of hard-to-manage stuff and trying to put it into a portal-like environment. The data one's a little bit different. This is much more process-driven. The content's typically more structured. It's coming out of some form of different database systems, and we'll touch on some of them. Often, the data ideally is consumed automatically, so you're getting real-time updates. You're seeing a snapshot of what's going on in the business right now. It's got the highest potential value, often, particularly if you are aggregating multiple data sources, which is what a portal should be doing. You start to get the patterns coming across from different systems. That can influence a decision. It's also the hardest to implement as a result because you're trying to tie together different data sources and bring them into a cohesive answer. 
Um, who here has heard of Facebook's acquisition of Instagram? They paid a few bob for it, a billion dollars. And a lot of people think that's bonkers. Um, I love the fact Instagram started at $2 billion. Uh, that was brave. <laughs> Note to self on <laughs> acquisition. Why do you think Facebook bought Instagram? Partly because of the people using it. Anyone else want to venture? Partly. I would say it's partly, but there are other apps out there. They could spend a lot of money doing it. Partly, yeah. You're getting much, much warmer. The photograph concept is interesting. I would wager one of the real values, because a lot of people say, well, next they'll buy Pinterest, you know, the one where we're putting slices of content into an activity stream on a web. Pinterest has got less value to Facebook than Instagram. Instagram has the potential to nuke Foursquare, because with Foursquare, we check into... We, it's a royal we here, because I don't. Um, people that use Foursquare will check into a location. They're choosing to do that. You have to create an account, you sign up, you become somebody, I think... I saw it go through on Twitter stream as become the mayor or whatever of this building through checking in through Foursquare. The beauty of a tool like Instagram is it's a much wider audience. I'm not interested in Foursquare. I don't really have any need to tell people where I am. I'll tweet just, oh, here I am if I'm trying to meet up. But I might take a photo to share with my family. And when I take a photo on my mobile phone, it automatically will geotag my location. I've just checked in location without me explicitly having to do anything. It's an automatic update. It's the most valuable data we can get because it's less open to manipulation by users. It just streams automatically. It's the hardest stuff to get and it's the most valuable. So I think it's quite interesting because I think that's the proposition partly to Facebook. So actually all the answers are correct. But I think above all else, it's that ability to get data out of those photos that we didn't as users have to make, put effort into capturing in the first place. I just took a photo because I want to share the picture. But now they've got a date, time and a location all captured automatically. And as we go increasingly, increasingly mobile, that makes a difference. I know this is totally off track, Sharon. It's OK. I mean, you keeping an eye on time. Obviously, don't, uh, didn't expect this one. Um, Sharon doesn't use Foursquare. She uses Instagram photos, whatever. Don't use Instagram either. Well, OK, <laughs> but you could. Yes. But the whole point More is that... With compliance, that is zero-click compliance. You want to get Fair. the information there by the user easily into whatever me mechanism system you've got to store it. If people have got to do stuff like tick boxes, sign in, etc., etc., they're not going to do it. Or 50% of, of the people. I, I'm not. I'm, I hate Foursquare. I don't want people to know where I am. <laughs> But this is a really important part on the compliance, because uh, those of you that were in my session yesterday, I used the quote about Sergi Brin. Metadata's fine as long as people aren't doing it. This is people not doing it. And Instagram is people not doing it. Yeah, I can put my commentary around it, but there's automatic capture there that's valuable. You could argue Instagram was valuable to Google, and that maybe is a little bit like the Skype acquisition was a bit crazy too. But automatic updates, definitely a future huge, huge value. Third type, search. This one's a lot more activity driven. We tend to start mixing up both the structured and the unstructured content. I'm looking for something. I kind of know it's out there, I just need to find it. You know, whether it's within the organisation, whether it's outside the organisation. So a real mishmash of content. We increasingly see some sort of standard structure to search results pages. Whether it's SharePoint internally, whether it's Google or Bing on the internet, we're getting familiar with this concept of a broad search to start with, narrowed down by filters on the left-hand side. Even if it's simple ones that we see on Google, oh, are you looking for maps, images, news sources? You know, it's a refiner to bring the results down. We see images or videos embedded in the search results, you know, and you can even hover over some of them, they play. And from an organisation perspective, and certainly this is one that SharePoint likes to do, is pulling out people as well. Often, internally within an organisation, when we're searching, we're often searching for the person. Who wrote that document? Because they're going to have the answers that I need, not the document itself. The document's out of date, but who created it? That's what's important. So people come in. So it's a different style. It's seeking answers. So you might get some suggestions back at you. Oh, didn't think to search from that. It's some serendipity. It's less force-structured than a, a data-driven portal. Uh, just a different, different approach. The fourth is the social network, is the people side. This is we don't know what we know. 
classic. You know, I mean, no organisation really has a true handle of the different valuable human resources they've got in the organisation. I don't know all the experts out there. I don't know what I know. It's also the most action-oriented from the user perspective. I say also because it's also in certain scenarios. I present this style at conferences that are nothing to do with any specific technology. So SharePoint can get a little bit of a hammering when we get to this point. If you think of sites like Facebook or like Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, they are so activity driven, they shove it in your face at every opportunity. Big bar in the center at the top, post your update, upload your pictures, do something, you know, because the value, the only value is that they've got stuff. So the more they can get you doing it and sharing it, the more they can scrape in the process, the more valuable. It's a conversation timeline. And there's usually boxes to then participate like that, don't like it, add a comment to it. So it's all about the user. And it's all about conversation. So this is beyond unstructured dot content to stuff that sometimes too easily flows straight from our mouth or our fingers to the keyboard and onto the network. You tend to get quite raw knowledge in these scenarios. You might not like all of the knowledge. You might not like what people are saying about you. That's the classic for brands when you go to Facebook. It's a, you get a much more potential honest feedback. But it's a different style of portal. And if you've got any kind of organisation that really is trying to get intellectual property out of people, well, actually, the social network style portal is going to start getting increasingly valuable to you because people are comfortable with this mechanism. You know, I always say, I used it yesterday in a, another session I presented, I could kiss everybody at Facebook because I remember 10 years ago trying to get people to upload photos to an early incarnation of SharePoint. Ugh, what do we want to do that for? It's like, but it's so useful. You meet someone for the first time to actually be able to walk into the meeting room and go straight at them and say, hi, Paul, how are you? Because you just check their photo so you know what they look like. I'm fine, thank you, Shanna. I just want to put, bring up, out a point about demographics of employees in the organisation. As we are getting older and older, and I, I do a bit of Facebook, I don't do any tw tweeting or whatever, then you will find that as youngsters come in, then they are really, really comfortable with this and they expect this. They're not email junkies. They are social website junkies. And that's the way they communicate. That's the way that I know that my daughter's friend has dumped a boyfriend. Then um, it's, it's very personal and it's all out there. But they don't do email. They don't do telephone calls. They just sit on this. And uh, yeah. you need to take that into account as the younger people come into the workforce. And you think how big a shift that is. That portal view from 2001. Every, an awful lot of customers I went to, very, very concerned about the ability for the individual to add and remove boxes to the page. Yet we don't get to do that on our Facebook streams or our LinkedIn streams. You know, they pretty much control the UI. It's what you do in it that matters. So, but it's highly, highly personal. I choose who I connect with or not. You know, I create a complete personalised stream. Not always wisely. You can create a real echo chamber. You tend to you know, surround ourselves with people like us. So sometimes pushing new people into the network is very valuable to disrupt the light cycle a little bit. But it's very, very personal and it makes those connections. And those connections spread and work throughout the organisation. So, four different approaches, all arguably different styles of portal. How hard can that be? I often I'll, I'll whiteboard this for clients. So there's two axes to consider. How important is it to the business? Because that should help drive some of the decisions. And how practical is it to implement? This is too often not considered, in my opinion, particularly if we jump straight to the technology. We tend to like think, oh, well, we'll find a way to do it. If we position those four different types, I would argue they're roughly fallen here. Not perfect, this is just a sample. News is pretty easy to get out there. It's often run by a communications team. They've got a structure, I believe, whether it's a weekly newsletter. There's a process that they've run to. It's quite practical and easy to do. They would not put it here on the importance scale, but in reality, to the business as a whole, it's not the most important stuff. It's not going to change the stock price. It's not going to necessarily help people make different decisions. It's keeping them aware of stuff. So it's lower down on the important scale. Search, slap in the middle, because it's not totally impractical. Some sources can be hard to get to. It's not totally easy either. So I'd put it about mid-range, equally on the importance. 
because the more you index and the more stuff you've got, the harder it is to start to tease out what really matters in there. So it is important, but it's, you know, I wouldn't put it at the top level. The dashboards back to that data and automatic updates, easy to position that near the top. That's your data-driven decisions, your evidence-based decision-making process. You know, where's the numbers? What's the data behind this decision? We're very, very, rightly or wrongly, many organisations are highly focused on this. So they would place it high, but we'll touch on it more in a moment, hardest to implement as well as a result. I've split the people into two because putting together a directory is actually pretty easy to do. And, you know, people, if they can want to find people, they'll find sources through it. So the portal can give you that. But on the important scale, the more valuable stuff is in the know-how. And that's the social network conversation that may or may not be taking place in the organisation. So I'd break them into two. I have to say, I meet a lot of companies that find this bit hard, just getting contact details. So, you know, pros and cons. And then there's our friend compliance, you know, which isn't to be forgotten because it is, of course, high priority because it's typically a requirement placed on your organisation by another. It's typically out of the organisation's control to a degree of what they have to do here, but they're told they have to do it. So I, I, my feel for everyone tasked with compliance because it can be a real rod for your back. If you look at some of the push at the moment in the news between government and internet service providers telling them how much data they've got to keep because they might dip into it once in a while and see where we've all been surfing. Yeah. That's compliance being pushed from the government onto the technology companies. And Brad mentioned it yesterday in, in governance that if you, it is easier to do compliance up front than it is to retrofit it. I spend... 50% of my time being paid to do back-end retrofit compliance, and it's just a very, very expensive way of going about it for organisations. Well, you can't do it all in advance, because next no, year a new can't. regulation could be created, but and you have, to adopt, you have to abide to it, so it's the ability yeah. to, to cope. And also, uh, anyone here heard of the book The Black Swan by uh, Nicholas Stout? Yeah, another one, it's the, we are rubbish at predicting the future big events that are going to disrupt us. You know, there's a real pushback on economists. Are they anything more than people with magic crystal balls? Because actually, he really did, I think in The Economist of all mags, did an analysis. And the quote I tweeted at the time was, you'd have been better off asking a dark throwing monkey what was going to happen in the next 50 years. It was quite painful. Um, I can't remember the source now. I'll have to go through my tweet stream. But yeah, we're quite bad at predicting, as it turns out. So... Yeah, you, you don't know where you're going to go. Uh, I also Another quote I read once on compliance, it was an interesting one, because an MP's perspective, a politician, uh, he felt regulation was great in times of economic hardship, as we are currently all experiencing, because you can create an entire industry through regulation. <laughs> and I have to admit, I'd never thought of it that way before, but he's absolutely right. You know, hard hat's now compulsory for everyone on a construction site, great for the hard hat manufacturers. You know, it's created a business model for them. Um, his attitude is more regulation is a great thing if we want to get the economy growing. I mean, take that one away and think about it. It's like a bit of a mind freeze um, because there's a frightening actual truth there which we've never contemplated before. Biggest challenge that we often face is that it's, very, it's too easy to wrap all of these up and call them the intranet. And now you've got your intranet project. You've got a big old project, if that's the case. Back to that initial thought. Why do we need a portal? What decisions? What actions? It's not bad to have this, but this is not a portal project. This is an entire platform for information and knowledge. It's a big beast. So when you're choosing on size, yeah, how, what are your resources? This is an old mathematician's joke that, you know, you can get all the structure in the end, but there tends to be this blind spot um, where we put, we like, um, something happens there and then we get to the output. This is so true of portal projects. You know, we can draw our little dashboard, we can put the fake numbers in, but actually there's going to be some minor magic required to get to the outcome that we're seeking. When it comes to resource constraints, this is partly a follow-on as well from my session yesterday, uh, money is rarely the constraint. We start with a budget. I re apart from a very cash-constrained organisation, and if you're running out of cash flow, a SharePoint portal project is the least of your problems right now. Most organisations do not have a fixed budget. They'll tell you there's a fixed budget. But if there's a requirement, a business need and a good justification, the money will always be found, in my experience. Happy for anyone to completely disagree with me, but in my experience, <laughs> apologies to public sector people in the, in, in the room, but you know, particularly if it's a government project, you know, whatever the initial estimate is, I find a multiple of four 
is roughly right for about ten years later. Yeah. <laughs> Six, we're going up. And this is true. I mean, the, look at the Olympics, uh, for example. Um, high speed 2, HS2, this new railway that they want to run up the country. I have to put a disclaimer here. It's going 200 yards from my house. I may be slightly biased about it. Um, 33 billion, my arse, quite frankly. Please pardon the language. Uh, it'll go over 100 before it's finished, easily. Easily. It's the Manchester, Liverpool, Edinburgh and everyone else. Um, so money is never the problem. The, the money gets found. The biggest issues are people. Because remember, it's back to the start. A portal is about decisions and actions, the people that are involved, and the time. The time to build it and the time to use it. There's nothing worse than creating a fantastic dashboard of all the analytics you could ever want, want when people need to make a snap decision because they're not going to go back to the data. They're going to make the decision, and they're going to justify it, whatever's on that dashboard. It will support the decision they made. That's human nature. It has to. Read that book. That's, you know, it's all part and parcel of it. So it's people, and it's time. Time to get it up and running, and then the time of the people that are then going to use it, how much and how well they're going to use it. So on to some of the technical stuff. Where's the content? Everywhere, typically. It's in lots and lots and lots of different systems. And it's not just that. We don't have one file share and one website. We have lots of them. And they, anyone that's ever done a scoping exercise for a project, you find them everywhere. You know, there's one under the desk. Oh, my, there is one under the desk. Oh, yeah, that's, the, that's managing, <laughs> managing the servers. You acquire a company, you've now got at least two of everything. And they're often completely different backgrounds. You might have one company that is a Microsoft shop. The other one might be an Oracle, and that's a beautiful project to have for a, <laughs> a large consultancy. Paul, I feel HP could contribute. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure we could contribute. I'm sure any, any of the speakers can contribute to that. But when we're looking at all of this stuff, we go back to the, the whole premise of this business track. Don't boil the ocean. Just take a process, a little part of, of the area for proof of concept, and bring that information out. Because if you try and bring all this together in one go, you'll fail. Absolutely. So I would say this falls into three key areas with all these different systems. And actually, I cheated because there's kind of three under access alone as well. From an access perspective, can you get to it? Is it even feasible to connect to all these different sources that might be currently scribbled on a back of a napkin type portal? Maybe. Maybe not. Take our fizz oil example. Fizz oil. Fizz energy. I'm <laughs> hooked on the fizz there. oil thing. Could, I'd call it fizz champagne. That'd be more fun. Um, take our fizz energy example. Very skinny bandwidth to very remote locations. Rich data at those locations, but can we get to it? Can we even connect to it? And if we can, what's the full bandwidth? And that's not just how fat and happy your network pipes might be. If you're in the financial services, and you've got, and for example, banks, well, those ATM machines that serve up money, they dominate the bandwidth. They're more important than anything else. So, you know, even if you can connect to it, how frequently can you connect to it? How much time you're allowed to interrupt the system getting the data out? So there's all sorts of questions around here. And back to the ball of the ocean, is this is a, can be a real minefield to get through. And then the third on access is ownership. Who owns the data? And are they going to let it go? And are they going to let it come into this portal? You know, and do you know? You know, is that this, this is the server on the desk? Who owns that server? Well, it's been here since I was here, and yeah, no, hang on, I'll ask Fred. Ah, oh, it's been here for years. And um, joking aside, a, a large organisation I've done some work with who are very global. That exact scenario they've got, and it's still working. They have a server running a website with an interactive form that a very, very large and well-known brand puts in their requirements through this form, and they have no idea where the server is. They haven't physically found it. In their, they don't know which build. They're, a mass, they're an absolute amalgamation of different acquisitions, and they don't know where this server is. They know it's switched on, and it's stayed on for a heck of a long time now, but they are trying to track it down at all the different physical Laker. It seems nuts, but I kid you not, they've had a hell of a job. It, sca it scares them daily to get this server back under control. I did actually find it in the end, and it literally was. It was a server under a desk scenario. How did uh, you find it? Um, physically. No, how did you find it from the URL? Like, how did you find oh, well, it was, the process was well known because oh. it's a feedback mechanism. It had been in place, but nobody had actually questioned it because it goes through email. So they put it through a form, but the form then emails to the people, and there's an option, there's an admin UI, so you can make sure the right people get emails. So the process worked. Um, nobody had any idea <laughs> what was powering the site, which is scary. It can happen. You know, in complex organisations, this can happen. 
Standards is another one, particular for mergers and acquisitions now. Have you got multiple different proprietary systems? Is there any kind of common language that's going to thread these together to deliver a portal? That in itself, huge project, you know, information architecture starts to kick in here. How can we consolidate and figure this stuff out? And then the one that we easily tend to forget is the quality. How good is the data? Is the data going to be the kind of data you'd want to make serious decisions on the back of? To give another example of a client, very carefully don't name names, and I don't try not to talk about my clients too much on Twitter because people might join the dots, funnily enough, which would be quite scary and embarrassing. But they have an issue, and a very important issue for their, their business leadership team, where they're required to present certain key performance indicators, KPIs, normal stuff. Um, the trouble they've got is there's a middle layer of management, and there are certain people in that, that, that level. They know what the outcome is required. They know what the target is. You can see where this is going. They manipulate the underlying data. They make sure the right, amount, the right data goes through so it's green not red, because red means they get into trouble. Um, shocking, but that's human personality. That's back to, if you let humans involved in the metadata or in the data, you're going to get skewed outcomes. So what's the quality like of the content? And then where's the content going? Are, you know, are all these systems going to stay in place, or are we actually looking to migrate and replace? We're not really touching on migration a huge amount in this track, I don't think. And guys, I'm just checking... No, I haven't not. missed somebody's so, session. So if you can talk to us. Absolutely, because obviously in itself, that is a huge project. And if, it, this, if you have a project that starts from the standpoint that we want a portal, and then they want to talk about content migration, that's not a portal then. You're replacing systems, you're putting in new platforms. So it just skews the project. Okay. So the migration bit was going to be coming in under the compliance side. So You've got a load of stuff out there that you don't know what you've got, the server underneath the um, desk. So you go forward, find all this information, comes back to Bill's findability stuff, and then you make a decision on that data. Do you want to destroy it? Do you want to put it into a records management system? Do you want to put half of it in here and whatever? So it's another part, but it's one that we, we aren't actually covering in this session. Yeah. So next year, I'm sure we'll do some, something about migration. <laughs> Absolutely. How's the pace, by the way? Is it okay? Thank you. And then, where are the users? You know, because they are going to be fairly important to the project. You know, where do the users all sit? And there's really three big issues here. And, you know, at least one of them I've touched on in a previous session. First is the location. How distributed are they? You know, if you're doing a portal project for a single office, no matter how large, that's, your life is a lot, lot easier than if you're globally distributed and people are splintered all over the place. You know, how do you serve up the right information to them? Because the chances are somebody located over here wants a very different set of data to the people located over here. So it's quite hard. You know, and somebody over here is going to be quite specific about what they want. You know, so are we talking about lots of portals, lots of different aggregations and different methods? Language. Is language barriers going to be an issue? You know, we always tend to really... <laughs> We joke with the Americans that, you know, we like English, UK, code 44, please. Um, it's a technical one, sorry. It's one little technical pass that won't leave me alone. Um, but obviously in Europe, different perspective entirely. You know, multilinguals are given. I'll give you a short side story out of amusement. I might try and get it hacked out of the recording. When I was at Microsoft um, back in 2000, I was the first person outside of Redmond to become full-time on SharePoint and looking at SharePoint from a feedback perspective and... Requirements. So I was the European, actually I was the, the outs, not everything outside of the US representative, but the only, you know, my, my location is Europe, so bad luck Asia, it was pretty much Europe and the US. And I remember multilingual support. I remember being in one client, it was in the public sector in the UK, asking me when Welsh support was coming into SharePoint. But, mm. <laughs> like, it's in word. Um, but, you know, this is it. Getting multilingual on the agenda. Um, please don't take offence any Americans in the audience, but when it's a product produced by an American company, multilingual support from a technology is really strong. You know, it tends to come later on. And to be fair, SharePoint's pretty good now. It's not bad at all. But in terms of the use of the system, you know, what languages are we dealing with? It's pretty pointless indexing loads and loads of stuff that if you can't read... Some global companies will be quite harsh about this. I've, I mean, Paul may be able to help here too. I've certainly got one that's very global, and 
it's debatable, really, whether English in its various guises is the dominant language. It really is very debatable. But they made an absolute decision. It's their business language. Um, <coughs> rightly or wrongly, you know, I mean, it's hard when you start out speaking English. Picking up other languages gets a lot, lot harder. I'm envious, almost. Um, but that was their decision. But I'd be interested to hear. Some other organisations may not have that decision. Some, some orga other organisations uh, I've been working with actually have set up a portal that's in... Swiss French, Swiss German, and Swiss Italian, but all the underlying servers are running the English code for supportability, so there's stuff going on around there. The one about the language, there are now some US states that must have Spanish and English as their official languages. So our American colleagues are coming along quite happily on that one. And that's leading into the culture. There are some cultures who are more visual than others and they like a different view of the world in your social side so this is it I would say culture is almost the biggest one in every respect is it not there's the culture in terms of our regional differences and there are obvious we've all experienced them I've managed to offend too many other nationalities and not meant to but because we've got very different cultures you know we can be quite a sarcastic nation on the whole and apologies to British that are not sarcastic but my family are really sarcastic. You know, I kind of grew up in a very, very sarcastic, dry environment. And boy, has that bitten me a few times in conversations. Um, but it's not just our regional backgrounds. Culture within the organisation. Is it a sharing culture? Or historically, is it a sharing culture? Because if you're bringing in this portal, you're expecting people to contribute all their stuff so we can make better decisions without you. Uh, it's usually the bit that everyone in their mind <laughs> puts on the end of that. So is the culture there for sharing? So big ones. But then what about the future? You know, I don't think the word portal is going to go away anytime soon. It's what the underlying technologies are and what it looks like that's going to change. So I'm just going to briefly touch on some of the future challenges that you may not yet face or can certainly come up. And the first one's easy, cloud computing. Because it's all the vendors are talking about. You know, they'll have you on cloud computing one way or another over the next five years. Um, ironically, compliance is actually one of the big drivers apart from the data flow. There are other reasons why it will actually force in cloud. But from a portal perspective, and I could spend obviously an hour on cloud alone, I think it's the identity point, the access point into information that will change. As more and more of our content goes online, even from an organisation's perspective, will we one day see this type of scenario where you actually just go to the company website and at the top you've got the options, link, you know, log into the internet, log into the extranet, log into everything. You don't fire up the VPN session. It isn't all behind a firewall. It's your identity that determines what access you get. And I, often, I, I really do believe we will probably start to see these sort of three levels of identity for most websites or platforms and portals, including the likes of Facebook. We're already halfway there, pretty much. There's the anonymous concept that is reducing on the internet. There is less and less content available to you without you first creating an account and logging in so that you can be tracked. Or not, if the European Union with the cookie situation at the moment try and stop, but it's going to happen one way or another. So you can read stuff anonymously, but it's getting increasingly hard to participate without first creating a login. And that's the second level. You choose to create an account because now you can participate. I think for portals going forward, the difference is that there will be the option to request an account where you'll be validated first. You can't just go create an account and say, oh, yeah, that's right, I'd be a director of that division and then, hey, presto. Oh, no. You get to request access, but then when you log in, are you an employee? Are you a supplier? Are you a partner? Are you a customer? You know, it will just open up a wider or a different set of data to you all through your web browser. I think that's increasingly likely in the future. The second probably, and this is a big one I think we'd all agree coming up in terms of trends that are changing, is mobile. We're touching things now. You know, we interact with the data with our fingers like ding, uh, instead of having to type. You know, tablets are coming into the workplace. I've, my pet project at the moment is I have an Office 365 site. I'll happily show anyone in a break because it's quite ropey still at the moment, but I'm stripping out all of Microsoft's tiny little blue links and turning it into images because I can run it on my iPad and I can tap through stuff and do activity updates. It's not quite there, actually, and I'm going to touch on where there's some flaws still later on, which is why I use Dropbox a lot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but this touch interaction changes how we work with a portal. Then there's the second type. You know, a portal doesn't have to be something we look at. 
There's Siri. I'll see how many people read the slide because the yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Normally get a few chuckles. You love the sense of humour that Apple have actually put into Siri. Apologies if you can't quite see it on the side. It's the you know you're looking for a dead you know you need to hide a dead body, and it actually gives you some ideas. <laughs> it's brilliant, uh, and it's a genuine one for those of you that got an iPhone 4. You can actually ask. You need help to hide a body. Now, there's all, all sorts of sniffy conversations between Apple and Microsoft, it has to be said, and even Google. I mean, well, at Microsoft, we're a bit, well, we've had voice recognition and voice stuff. Um, the difference with Siri is it's looking at the end-to-end -end process without you having to look at the screen. You've still got to tap it, so you can tell why it's in beta, because it's far from perfect, because you've got to start the process. But it's the idea that you can instruct it and carry on, and it actually then create an action for you through voice. Whereas previously, we could get an answer back, but you've then still got to look down at the screen, at the weather report, or at, it will actually read you the results back out. So hearing things, instead of having to read them, it's, it's a portal. It's a, it's a search portal. That's all Siri is, in effect. It's pulling the right different information, whether it's weather information, whether it's map updates, and telling you the answer. And then the third level that's coming in, which is, you know, Microsoft has to have a little bit of love back again, uh, is Connect. This idea now that we don't touch anything at all. We sort of, whoa, 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 a very minority report without the gloves. Um, but this is one real world example where they took a Connect so that surgeons, because surgeons, once they're, you know, suited and booted to do surgeon stuff, um, they can't touch anyone or anything. You know, they're sterile. But they look at the x-rays, and here they can actually go fium, fium, straight through multiple different x-rays. Well, that's a portal to them. It's helping them make a decision and then act on it. So that's a portal. So will we start? I'm not saying we're all going to be like Minority Report within the next two years in our organisations, but it's a new star that we'll start to see come in. Yeah. Sorry, is there a question there? No, just, just checking. So, and then there's the ultimate. Is actually, are we seeing apps replace the portal? You know, is your home screen on your iPad? Who's here has got an iPad? Great. Hands down. Who's got an Android tablet? Yeah, good luck. Who's got... Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Can we scratch that bit out of the recording? Who's got a Windows tablet? I actually have a Windows tablet as well. Um, but the, the tablet concept has pushed apps really to the fore. Very, very dominant in the consumer space for the last few years, but we will see so much more of this push into the business space going forward. What's interesting is Microsoft's take is slightly different. I think this is what makes it more a portal than anything. These tiles concept through this metro interface that's in Windows 8 is it's an app, but we give you a slice of information on that start screen. So you can see the, just the one bit of weather. You can see the latest email. You can see how many tasks are waiting for you to complete. Well, isn't that a portal? And it's your start screen. Where's SharePoint in this? I don't normally do that at a SharePoint conference. Um, but that's the, that is the question mark for the office team. Obviously, SharePoint's got ideas there, and we're not going to delve into the future of it. But I would argue that, really, the start screen's becoming your portal. And the funny thing here is this is the most personal portal of all. Because how many of you have organised your apps, whether it's on iPad, like me, or on any other, where you've organised what icons are on the home screen versus on a later screen? We're actually making quite an individual statement. I mean, Bill would have a field day with psychology on this in terms of, you know, what it says about you, the apps you choose to have on your home screen. I'm deadly dull because all my business apps are on my home screen and all the fun stuff. Well, the news is on screen too. My fun media stuff is on three. Four is utilities, five is games. It's like one, two, three, four, five I on the train. I think it's also the way that organisations are going. You talked about the demographics, younger people coming in. This is the way that they like to do it. This is the way that other, other types of software are going, all the apps come in. And then you can make it your personal view, and therefore you're more likely to use it. So you're going to have better user adoption. If, if, if it's suitable for me and it does what I want it to do, I'm going to use it. If I get a... One forced upon me that's got nothing to do with me, I just go elsewhere. And that user adoption bit is huge. I mean, we have a session coming up on user adoption because it's a biggie. You know, it can be the make or break a project. But, you know, if you're about to embark on a very big portal project that may take the next three years to implement, what are portals for everybody else going to look like in three years' time? Because you're building what you understand and have access to today. We're likely to see quite a big shift, I think. Certainly quite soon in terms of what exactly is a portal. So anyway, teasing back into our example, we're going to use this Fizz Energy as a little bit of a case study to map through and these sort of recommendations that I often give to clients to how to kind of get 
your head around this concept. So first up, we have some business goals. We know these, I'm not going to spend time, but it's basically make information more important and more accessible. The big challenge in this particular scenario is it's obviously three companies in one. You're going to have different business priorities. What matters to Fizz Energy is going to be different to Fizz Explore, is going to be different to Fizz Renewables. So you've got competing business priorities with the double whammy of conflicting business goals. That need for compliance, the desperation to keep the talent. And that's the thing that can happen a lot in acquisitions is the good people, if they're not happy, they'll leave. So how do you incentivise and keep the talent that's ultimately going to be key to your future, if it's important? if it's important to your organisation. So imagine fears. We've got the, we need a portal. Obviously, you start to think about what are the priorities? What are the things we can build now that will make a difference now to the organisation? And the big one in this particular example would be, well, there's two. Exploration assessment, that's really core to the company. So if you can make a way of doing it better, improving the decisions, fabulous. That's going to have an immediate benefit to the business. So forget what communications want to do with news. Forget what the social media people want to do with social media. That's what really, really matters, being harsh about it. The social network, do you really want it to be a social network or do you want a skills matrix so that you know who has what expertise around the business? Very different things. Are you looking for people to spend time conversing and chatting and building relationships and building connections? Very, very good stuff. I'm not to say it's dismissive, but... It's also quite hard to do in organisations with time constraints, for example. <coughs> Often your best and brightest are the busiest. So getting them to actually stop and share is, can be quite a challenge. The business requirements are fairly obvious. But we've gone through these there on the previous session, so there's obviously going to be a need for remote access. And that's what makes this particular example great, because you could imagine in this exact scenario, I could envisage this client would be quite a challenge. Deliver them a portal today with the technologies they've got today, knowing that probably in a very rapid space of time, what they've got today is going to date. It's going to age very, very badly because we are in that sort of, we're starting that shift over to a more mobile social business model. So whatever you build today, if it's grounded on premise, it's going to age. I mean, SharePoint itself, I would say SharePoint 2010, has aged quite badly, actually. I think already it's... It's creaking in certain areas and where it's difficult to do the things you want to do on the platform. And it's interesting. So 2003, for all its flaws, and 2001, they, and they had many on the technical front, um, but they didn't date as quickly. So it shows you how different the actual external factors uh, are coming in. Do you think that rate of acceleration is going to slow down? Um, I don't know. I'd be a futurologist and prospecting and earning... Way more. Um, is the, the question was, is the rate of change ever going to slow down? Well, for, for us, quite possibly. You know, it probably will because the, the t we tend to underestimate how immature the technology industry still is. You know, it didn't, in this current guise, it didn't exist 100 years ago. 100 years ago, we'd have thought you were smoking something very funny and possibly, yeah, no, I won't say it. But we would say you were smoking something funny if you said you could have a conversation instantly with somebody in Australia from London. Like, what are you talking about? That, that you could see them that you could wave at them and they'd wave back and you'd see them wave back. It's like, that's magic. So the gallows with you. Um, you know, we were fascinated by camera technology. My God, how does that work? This, this three-dimensional organic, yeah, I know I'm appreciate at the time, we're actually not too bad. You now, how do we get that into this two-dimensional format on a screen? You know, we were fascinated. And they always, I think there's the quotes, others probably know this better than me, I'm always feeling it. It's the Arthur C. Clarke one where, you know, technology is, it's the magic to technology. Yeah, somebody's going to quote it and please go and tweet it so that I can... Stick it on the slides afterwards. Uh, it is, it's, you know, it's technology is just magic that we don't understand yet. And then it becomes a technology industry. So I think it's going to keep going fast. I think there's a lot of disruption for business now. I think in terms of in the consumer space, we've seen or we've assimilated a lot of different concepts quite comfortably. But at the moment, we still work predominantly the same. Or if I, most clients I go and visit, their offices are structured quite the same as they were 10, 20 years ago. And I think actually that's the the bit that's going to go through some disruption. But anyways, I must roll forward too, because yes, time is running on. I can see it on the clock. So, is it feasible? This is the big question. You know, why do you want a portal? And then can we actually do it? And this is uh, the model I try and work through with people to help tease out, can you really do this stuff? And this is really the, the one I want you to go away with. If we use our Fizz example, come up with the concept of personas. Describe the people you envisage 
using this portal. It can be a very clever way of very quickly ruling out certain one things that are just not going to be achievable. So two examples here. I actually, I know nothing about the oil industry. I went to Wikipedia. So we have the petroleum geologist in area with one brand. They're leading the bid. He's ultimately doing the exploration assessment. And then we have the Zenith geophysicist. Good job I haven't got a hangover. Um, who is an absolute expert in natural disasters and understands the implications, you know. There are certain oil companies that would benefit from that. Fizz is in a bidding war and a time issue here. They've got 48 hours to make a decision and get a bid in if they want to win it for some land they're pretty confident has got oil, but it's in an area that's going to be very, very difficult to extract. So is it pursuing? Time issue here. Pressure's on. If we put this into a conceptual model, and I've done a very, very simplified version here so that you can see it on the slides. Obviously, there'll be a bit more detail when we document these sorts of things. If we look at the current <coughs> issue, the current way of working is our petroleum geologist will consult his network, the people he knows. He will go to who he knows because he, he needs to make a decision. The fact is the answers might be out here, out here in this isolated minority or arguably majority. It might be bigger than his own network, but that's where the answers are. He's not going to consult to them. We're well, not going to have time to... I just want to say something here, because I've just had a phone call from my mate, the yellow person down at the bottom, and he's just said that... Well, in fact, it's on my RS, RSS feed on my portal. So, Falklands Explorer, Borders and Southern, have tum share prices have tumbled 30% because they have found wet gas close to where we're going to go. Wet gas is more important than gas, but not as, uh, there's not much money in it compared to oil, so we need to find oil. So that piece of information, if we're in this scenario, we don't have that. So we could be overbidding on that land because we will find wet gas and we, know, we don't know anything about it. So we need to... to Thank build. you, Paul. Very, very good way of framing it. So where do we want to be? We want to find a way to get this guy's knowledge. That knowledge is important to us and we need it quick. So this is what we want. We want to widen our network. This is what the portal's all about. How do we achieve this? So we go from the concept to the, well, is it feasible? What do we have here? Um, we could start with a wireframe. We could mock up, well, it'd be great. We could have this like social network, you know, people with the right skills down here. And if they update their skills profile, they'll automatically be populated in this resource. And here's our data and here's our, our news feed. Very easy to draw. Easy to draw, hard to do. And the challenge you often have with the portal project, if you're really unlucky, is those of you that were in my other session, I mentioned how the, there's a tendency to get requirements shipped to you on Excel. It's like, look, how hard can it be? I just put it on a single Excel spreadsheet. It's even worse if it comes in PowerPoint format. <laughs> <laughs> because they've visualised it as well, just to help you along the way. You know, and you think, Thank you. Uh, because they're already locked down. They've got something in their mind, and that can be quite hard to shift. But the real, the real nub of this, and it's the one I really, issue I want you to keep in your mind, is will it actually change the decision process? That guy's got 48 hours, and he's used to a culture where he will just email his network, they'll give him answers. He's mobile, so he's got Dropbox. He's got all the documents he needs on a regular basis synced and available to him offline. And you're now telling him to go to a portal that requires a pretty heavy connection to present all this information and go find people there. If you've got a real heavy email culture inside your organisation, that's an issue to consider when you're trying to get everybody to use a portal. I'm working with a client right now, and they're actually a very small client. They're only about 60 people, highly, highly mobile. They don't have much IT budget. They've installed SharePoint Foundation on a server, and they actually asked me to come in and say, can we do what we want to do on SharePoint Foundation? Right, uh, the exact question was, basically, can we do this without having to buy licenses for SharePoint Server? Can we, you know? And they wanted a huge knowledge portal. And actually, it's not whether or not they want the licenses for SharePoint. It's whether SharePoint is even the right solution, because... They need knowledge available on, on sites. They're never going to have a network connection. And they get updates very quickly. And these people, a lot of them are associates, so they're not direct employees. Again, they have a culture of if they get an update, whack it through on email and share it with the group, because it's only 60 people. So that's a real culture, and it's a culture that's quite a strong one. Is the portal going to do a better job than email and Dropbox for them? Well, the portal has got to do a better job, because otherwise you won't get the adoption of the portal. So one thing about going into the prototype is that you can run a prototype for a week, get feedback from it, build the next one, and then go on a weekly cycle for 
going on on that so that you actually get buy-in from the users as well and you also get the design and the biggest thing about design the portal is that's not our official color we have trademarked that particular color of red so I, I expose one of my uh, clients there but they have a color that if you see it on a door in the UK you you actually have to pay royalties to this other place because you have used that colour. Okay, to wrap up, conscious that time's moving on and I'm potentially in the way I think of lunch, which is you always are. worse. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Better look at the food warm. Very, and it is literally quickly. It's just two slides, that's all, to do a very quick wrap up. So we need a portal. What to do? Well, first off, do define, is it a portal that you need? And back in that previous scenario, that client... I think a portal could help them. I think it would help them have knowledge that they could reuse to more people afterwards. But they've got, more, they've got bigger problems to solve first before it will help them a great deal. So know what problem you're trying to solve. It might actually not be a portal yet. Identify the priorities because it's back to the boil the ocean comment. You know, what matters most and what can be achievable today? Because in this fabulous you know, question, are we going to keep seeing this rapid pace of change? In the business space, we're going to see, I think, a lot of disruption. You, know, you can imagine Microsoft being quite nervous about this because it's potentially, I think, the biggest shift since we had the mainframe to client PC model, which in itself took a long time. Mainframes are still around. You know, it's not that they're dead. I hate this whole post PC. I say beyond PC because I think PCs have certainly got a role, but their role is becoming marginalised. I think tablets will become the mainstream role. We might dot them, because we might still like our keyboard. I'm a very efficient <coughs> typist. So I'm still going to have plenty of scenarios where I need a keyboard. But at the moment, I go to meetings at some clients, and if they won't let me use my own kit and I have to use theirs, it's brilliant, because I can't show them anything. I have to say, oh, yeah, well, when I get back, I'll email you that. No portal involved. You know, how much of us do that? In a meeting, I'll email you the numbers when I get back to my desk. Tablet is here. Let me show you. I'll tell you what I'm talking about. So big change is coming up. Focus on urgent and current priorities. Don't worry too far into the future, which, you know, portal gets us thinking big visions, but bring it back down to the present. But hence, I've already pretty much answered this one, consider those future demands. And if you can see and feel that that shift is likely to impact your organisation, all the more reason to scope down and chunk it and say, let's focus on what matters today and how we do it today. Check the feasibility. Uh, I email such an easy one because it's been such an efficient mechanism in the past, so it's a hard nut to crack sometimes if that's the culture. <laughs> Confirm what your resource constraints are, and it will be people and time, not money, typically. And I say, and if it is money, you don't need a portal. You've got a business, bigger business issue going on. So different, different debate entirely. And if somebody comes up to you and says, we need a portal, the one thing you should always say is, great, we need a stakeholder. Who's sponsoring this? because it does require quite a senior level of engagement, because they are tough decisions. They are not easy decisions, so it's not something that can just be delegated to a project team who then has to constantly hit barrier after barrier after barrier to get to the content, to get to the people, to bring something together. You need that support, and you need that support at a very, as, as senior level as possible. They ideally on the board, if possible. You don't always get it, but, you know, we need a stakeholder. And back to the opening slide. Why do we need a portal? Ask that question. It's to improve decisions and actions. It's become, make it a mantra. Every time you're getting hooked upon a detail, and none of the technology vendors here will thank me, before you get hooked upon a, well, SharePoint doesn't do that, so what add-ons do we need to buy to make it do that? Focus on the decisions and actions, because the technology is just the enabler. We tend to forget the original purpose. And just this, I kept it, reminder, I can't stress it. I don't normally make such a blatant recommendation for somebody else's book. I get no royalties from this. It's not, there's no hidden agenda. But if you are interested in this stuff and you're interested in the human element of this, this is a fabulous starting point for how a project can get... It's nothing to do with project management, but it's how we can make flawed decisions, and they're the things that will trip up the value in the technology. With that, I think, actually, I'm not too far over at all. We're pretty you're, much bang on. You're pretty on. on time. Yay. I'd love to say that was planning. Um, <laughs> I was originally was hoping to have 10 minutes with you. My details are there, so I'm more than happy to engage in a follow-up conversation. And I'm in no hurry to get lunch, so if you've got any questions and you either want to sit down and shout them out or come to the front and let other people leave, open to the floor. It's, uh, it's all yours.